on Zoom, her attending virtually. And um, I also want to thank uh, uh, King City Library staff. Uh, we have Chris Wicker, we have Sally Ibarra, and Lisa Perez, and Giselle Perez, who are here. And uh, they've done a fabulous job of helping to get everything ready for this program. And then, last but not least, I want to introduce our wonderful presenters. Uh, we have John Jernigan, Karen Jernigan, and Howard Strong, um, who just finished the book uh, King City, which is part of the Images of America series by Arcadia Press. And I've just looked at it um, about 10 times, and it is fabulous. The images are wonderful. and just an invitation to really delve even deeper into the history. Um, just a few things before we start. Um, this program is going to be recorded. Uh, and also, I appreciate it if you could hold your questions to the end. There'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. And, um, and that's it. Uh, Howard Strong has been a historian of King City and South County for over 40 years yeah. and uh, has done amazing work. Uh, he worked uh, in uh, Priest Valley, mm -hmm. also in Big Sur mm -hmm. and, uh, and in King City. And uh, John Jernigan was born and raised in King City. Mm -hmm and has also authored many articles and uh, over the years and been uh, also with Karen Jernigan put together an amazing collection of postcards and other images about King City over the many years. And Karen Jernigan came to King City in 1971, Seven. 1977, and uh, was a reporter for the King City Rustler, who also was a, a city councilwoman. And she did an amazing job of, of putting together the written aspect of the King City book. And I'm going to let you all tell the rest of the story. All right. So would you, are you going to go ahead and start your slides? Okay. We'll use what the slides. we're going to do now is we're going to start the slides, and I'm also going to start the record button. hybrid world after yes. COVID. Huh? Well, um, thank you everybody for being here and thank you for the people that are on uh, um, <clears throat> on the wire. Um, basically this first picture here uh, is a cover of our book um, King City and it's a uh, you know the images of America by uh, Arcadia but a lot of people have said where is that picture in King City and so uh, a couple of days ago I went to the location which is on First Street my back in the second picture, my back is to the L.A. Hearn building that is fronts on First Street at Pearl, where Pearl crosses the railroad tracks. And I'm looking west, and that is the old King City um, um, Auto Court right there. And so, uh, or Auto Camp, I guess you might say. It still exists. Obviously, the arch is gone. Uh, it's been converted to H2A housing, but that is the location that that photo was taken. But uh, as Karen was saying, actually, the, our beginning of our presentation is these two books. And um, <clears throat> the first book, uh, Salinas Valley, that was done in 2005, and then some of our good friends, uh, uh, Sue Raycraft and Ann Beckett, did a San Antonio Valley book. And that was those are inspirations for us. Um, they're available um, you know, in different places also. Uh, but they gave us an idea of what could do it, and we had the images, and that once we uh, partnered with Howard, we realized that uh, we could be a kind of a trifecta. You know, I could do pictures, Karen could do help with editing, and Howard could help with the, uh, the heavy lifting about the knowledge of what we were using. So um, anyway, so... So we're going to tell you a little bit about the three of us, and I'm going to start. Um, 
So this is uh, a picture. I think this is a funny picture uh, of me when I first came to King City. I had just graduated from California State University, Fresno. I had a degree in journalism and I really wanted to work in a small town and uh, I found out about uh, a job that was available in 1977 at the King City Rustler. I was uh, a classmate of Patty Casey, who was the daughter of Harry Casey, the publisher. And I was a friend of John Peckema, who was working at the Greenfield News. And they both recommended me for the job. So I never even met Mr. Casey. I just talked to him on the phone and he hired me and said, would you come for the summer internship? And so I said, okay, I, sure. And uh, so I came for three months and this is 43, 45 years later. I am still here. So three months turned into another year and then another year and I met John and and we got married and then uh, I have been here ever ever since. But I found that I really liked King City. I liked the small town. I liked the fresh air. I liked the mountains. I liked the setting. Um, I went on to, I worked for the wrestler for four years. And during that time, one of the things that I did was I wrote a column called Looking Back. And in the back of the wrestler office, there were these big books and they had the old copies of the Rustler newspaper going back to 1901. And so once a week, I would go back there and I'd look and see what happened 50 years ago, 25 years ago, 75 years ago. And I'd write a few uh, paragraphs about what the news of the day was and that would get printed in the paper. And I didn't really think much of it, but as I look back, I realize how much I learned about the names of the people, the places of people, the events that were happening just by reading those old newspapers. So uh, I stayed with the wrestler for about four years and then I joined John and his uh, family business, King City Glass, and I worked there for 40 years. And we just recently retired uh, and uh, before that, I served as a city councilwoman, and for four years, I learned a lot about the government of King City and uh, used the knowledge that I had from business and from working at a newspaper in, in that experience. So this was uh, what I looked like 45 years ago, and uh, so here we are today. <laughs> well, let me take a look. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I met Karen, I think my hair was longer than hers. I think it was. <laughs> um, okay, a little bit by, about myself. Obviously, you know, Karen said, you know, we've been married. We've been married 43 years, and um, we were blessed to spend 40 years together in business, working side by side, which is somewhat unusual. So sometimes people say, well, I never see you guys, you know, apart from each other, or whatever. But I mean, 40 years after 40 years, you know, it, it says. So this is a picture here uh, in front of our house. Uh, we live right across the street from the high school. Um, uh, was a parking lot. Now it's the new ag building. Um, those are our two children. Brandon is the small one in my arms. And Melissa is standing on the running boards uh, of, a, of my Studebaker truck. And uh, so I uh, was born in King City. Uh, I graduated from King City High School. Um, I went on to Hartnell for a while, and while I was at Hartnell, um, I um, was a, did a part-time job at KSBW as a cameraman, and so I spent two years uh, helping with the news, helping with the uh, special events and that kind of stuff, and that kind of uh, brought about some interest in photography and what have you, and uh, so then what happened was, is that after um, came back to King City, we're married, you know, we're kind of, you know, kind of at, at that stage in our life, I started collecting pictures of King City and uh, enjoying those. And so um, I went to uh, a gentleman named Pat Hathaway, who we actually just, San Antonio Valley Historical Association just did a presentation about his collection. But I went to Pat Hathaway, uh, who lived in Monterey, and I wanted to find some images of King City. And so he had some pictures of King City that I bought the pictures from him. And uh, at the same time, I asked Pat, I said, where did you get these pictures? And he said, well, they're from postcards. And I said, oh, really? And he said, you're not collecting postcards? And I says, 
well, no, I didn't know I was supposed to collect postcards. <laughs> and so that kind of started us on that, that tour. And so Karen and I probably have, well, I don't know. So let's say five or 6,000 photographs of King City now um, that we've either actually have the postcard of, or we have scanned a picture, you know, from somebody that has been gracious enough to let us do it. And so uh, one of the things about postcards that some people don't realize is that early postcards starting, let's say, in the late 1800s into about the mid 1940s or so, were what they called RPPC, Real Picture Postcard. So what that meant was is that your actual postcard was actually a picture with a postage on the back. And so those are very desirable because they're a real picture that can be scanned and turn out a beautiful image because the original photography was very deep because they took long uh, you know, exposures and it really saturated the, the film. So that's great. So that's kind of tells you a little bit about myself and Howard. Well, I uh, never lived in a, in a city. I've always lived in the rural area. So I've always been a Monterey County resident and as Jennifer mentioned, and actually born in King City where the water man was, but lived in San Arno and then Big Sur and Priest Valley and wherever I was, I always loved the history of that area, would get active in the groups and do research. I started 40 years ago uh, reading the microfilm of the Rustler when it was still the southern part, half of the uh, city hall down on Vanderhurst. And uh, I would come and uh, before the library was open so I could be the first one in line. And uh, Pretty soon uh, the librarian would come and say, uh, are you going to take a break? Uh, are you going to have lunch? No, I'm not going to have lunch because if I leave, someone might take my place. <laughs> so I'd stay as long as I could. Sometimes it'd be till eight o'clock at night. And there was no printer then. It was only the reader. So I brought a clipboard and 20 sheets of uh, lined paper. And once I got 20 or 22 sheets handwritten, my arm was telling me it was time to shut it down. So that would, be, but I would come maybe all depends, maybe uh, two times during that week, then I take a, a month break or whatever and come back again, just push myself to uh, read all I could. I, I, as they mentioned, the wrestler started not one, so I started the first issue not one, and I read every issue up to the mid 1940s. And then after that, it's just sporadically looking for different subjects. But I, I like reading each issue and each page because you see little tidbits here and there that you never heard anybody talk about before, but as it turns out, it was kind of interesting or something that was very important as far as historical. And then um, the way, then they got this modern uh, reader printer, uh, which is no comparison to the old one, because the old one, you kind of had to get used to the dead spider swinging on the web inside when the fan was on. And sometimes it would be in the way. So you'd have to move the writing up or below so where the spider was so you could see what you wanted to read. So, so the new one really spoils you compared to, to the, and that was a good part of the journey and led a campaign to purchase this wonderful thing in the King City Library to accept it here. So then when the, they caught me here one day researching, and then run the idea by of an Arcadia book. I'll think about it. I'll think. I like to use that. I'll think about it. And uh, but the more I thought about it, I thought maybe it's a good idea. So here's our product. I guess you could say. <laughs> well, just to tag on to that, uh, one thing I didn't mention when I was talking about the books in the beginning was is that Arcadia had contacted McCarlum and they uh, said, "Oh, you know, you need to talk to the Jernigans," and they called us. And we said, no, because we had a business. And we said, you know, call us back in a few years when we're, we're selling our business. And, and that's what they did. They actually called us back. And so, and then that kind of precipitated that. So thank you, Howard. Um, let's see, is this mine? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this, uh, this picture right here was, uh, of course, you have to take some sort of uh, advertisement pictures of, of who you are. You know, you have to keep in mind that we started this during COVID. And so we started out uh, in the very beginning, all wearing masks, sitting around a table uh, until we got comfortable with each other and kind of in our bubble. You know, we uh, 
uh, Howard, uh, obviously with his age and stuff was careful and we, so were we. And so anyway, this is one of the times when I think we took our masks off to take a picture. But anyway, it, we're actually standing in front of a 1898 map. And ironically, um, we were scanning some pictures and some of the pictures uh, that we started scanning for a guy named Lou Hare. And this map was created by Lou Hare, who was the, in 1898, he was the county surveyor for Monterey County. And so this is, map is actually hanging on our residence uh, on gracious loan for the Monterey County Historical Society. You like you're wearing the same outfit, too, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you see that, Paul? <laughs> hey, got a pin in my pocket. <laughs> but you got the thing built on. <laughs> and you know what, the, uh, Ron, I only have about 10 of these shirts in my thing, though. <laughs> you know, you, I got all that merch left over from my business, and I got to use it up, you know? All right. Who's turn? You. Am I? Oh wow! Exciting. Um, anyway, so um, what we're going to do is just take a little little journey down each chapter of our book. Um, you know, there's ten chapters in the book, and um, I'm not exactly who who actually kind of came up with some of these ideas. It was kind of a group effort. We we kind of brainstormed, but you know, certainly you know, uh, King City began in 1886 when the rails arrived, when the railroad came to King City. Um, and of course, uh, the railroad had stopped about 13 years before in Soledad. And then when people would come south, they would stop at Soledad, they would get on a stage or, you know, a, whatever you want to call it, stagecoach, and they would come down and their, their position would be they would go through Halone, that because Halone was a stage stop. Uh, we had some other stage stops along the way, Las Coaches, um, Plato. Um, and of course, when the rails arrived, it kind of changed things because um, it created a, um, a point where people were coming to rather than coming all the way from, say, to Soledad. And in 1888, the county built a bridge across our river. And so not only did we have uh, the railroad coming in 1886, we, in 1888, we had a bridge that was built across the uh, Salinas River that they completed in a considerably less time than they've been working on our bridge at this time. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so the first chapter is about that, you know, uh, about the beginning. Uh, certainly we could talk about King, you know, which obviously King City is named after. Uh, this picture does not have it, but some of the pictures of the railroad station that are on the on the face of the road station actually say King's City, which was a very early time. And Howard, what was that about? Nineteen what that they quit using that name? About nineteen ten. About nineteen ten. And so, um, you know that they quit using that. Although that name did hang on on different documents and stuff like that for a while. So the picture you just saw of the depot is the same uh, depot that got moved down to San Lorenzo Park, and that is still there. <laughs> and you know Howard. Uh, um, he did a lot of the of the of the beginning writing and then Karen edited it. But uh, you know, I just love some of his uh, stuff because in in this particular picture, you can see this young lady here. Her dress seems to be kind of poofed out in the back, and he mentioned something about the the wind. Uh, you know, I can't remember exactly how you phrase that, but uh, the uh, the normal afternoon winds, the Salinas Valley winds. Yes, exactly. That so works. so that we know that this is a real picture because, it, you know, this gal's dress is blowing here. So our second chapter, we called What Came Before, and we talk about the Salinan people. We talk about Pinnacles National Park. We talk about Mission San Antonio, and then the stage stops. And before King City was here, that's what was in this, this area. There were land grants, there were homesteads, but this stage stop um, was called Walker Station, right, Howard? Yeah. yeah. And later on, it's on the road to Halone. Um, when you leave King City and you go out Halone Road, this was uh, Walker Station a long time ago, and then it evolved into um what was called the Bombay Club and the Bombay Club was a popular place for soldiers who were out at Fort Hunter Liggett during uh World War II so we had never seen we had heard stories about the Bombay Club but we had never seen a picture of it and one day we were over in Monterey at the Mayo Hayes O'Donnell Library it's a history room in downtown uh Monterey 
And we were uh, asking the people there if they had any pictures of King City. And they said, yeah, we've got a few. And they said, but you might look over there in that drawer. And so they pulled open the drawer and there was a file that said King City. And in the very bottom was a little tiny picture about this size. And we looked at it. And we said, I wonder if that could be the Bombay Club. And I showed it to John. He was pretty sure it was the Bombay Club, but we had to come back to King City and show it to some other people who confirmed, yes, that was the Bombay Club. The reason there's very few pictures of it is because it burned down. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that happens and you don't really have a record of anything, but that's the only picture we know mm -hmm. of the Bombay Club, except the ones in the newspaper when it's burning down. Mm -hmm. so. so what about the, uh, what was written on the picture? <laughs> um, so it said on the picture something about toothache mm -hmm. and we thought well what does that mean toothache was that somebody's name was was what was that and then we kind of went back and forth and then finally we said well there wasn't anybody named toothache that that's a funny name that wouldn't be somebody's name and Howard said well there was somebody that owned this property and their name was Long Acre mm -hmm. and it was spelled differently. But that's a, something that happens in history is that a name can get changed, a couple letters, somebody can hear something, they hear it wrong, they write it down. And so we had to be really careful while we were researching to double check names and spellings and, and try to figure out if something didn't look right, how we would fix that. So Howard? Okay, so this of course, says the river runs through. So this is obviously um, one of the flood years. This this is the one that's up nine. Um, is this mm -hmm. number two, mm -hmm. number one, number one. No, okay. Fly, I've referred flying duck number one. <clears throat> this is the the cart uh, on a cable that a local uh, blacksmith, uh, uh, Joe Watson, constructed. The cable at the top of the photo attached to a tree on the bank, and then out to the end of where the bridge uh, has broken off. And this is how they would get the mail to the uh, west side of King City. Uh, 1909 and 10 and 1911 were big flood years. Uh, also uh, 1914. In fact, uh, I have a picture and it's in the book of uh, the 1911 flood. And it tore out also, it's always the east end of the, uh, of the bridge that gets uh, torn away. And there it has a picture of flying duck number two. And I remember reading in the Rustler that the Rustler itself didn't mention an article, but someone they were talking to said, oh yeah, I remember seeing that flying duck going down the river. So I'm assuming this one wound up going down the river. So in 1914, they had flying duck number two. <laughs> Okay, our chapter number four is our John Steinbeck connection. And this is a picture of John Steinbeck. Um, John Steinbeck was the author of the book, East of Eden. He's probably most well known for the Grapes of Wrath, but we like to claim East of Eden because it was set, the setting of East of Eden was in the Salinas Valley. And King City is mentioned, I think it's 48 or 50 times in that book. Uh, in 1952, John Steinbeck was getting towards the end of his career, and he wanted to write a book about his family history. So East of Eden is based uh, largely on his family history. It's, it's not uh, said to be fact in total. There was some fiction in it, but a lot of the details are accurate. John Steinbeck's grandfather, Sam Hamilton, was a homesteaded property down by Wild Horse Canyon, south of town. His mother, Olive Hamilton, was a school teacher until she met uh, John Steinbeck's father, who was John Ernst Steinbeck. And he was working down here by the railroad station at the SP Milling Company and was an agent at the, um, the warehouse there. And Olive was teaching school, they met, and they were married. And once a school teacher married in those days, they could no longer teach. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, they uh, the Steinbecks went on to have four children, one of which was Don Steinbeck. And so we like to let people know our connection to uh, a world famous author. All right, it's mine. That's you. Okay, um, chapter five, the turn of the century, and you know, kind of talks about uh, 
um, some of the things that happened uh, after the turn of the century. Uh, this particular picture we love because first of all, uh, the building on the right, which is the with the arch in it, still exists. It's now a pizza parlor. It was uh, the Monterey County Bank uh, built in 1917. Its brother or sister, if you would call it, uh, resides in Gonzales, uh, is now Luigi's, um, that looks very similar, built by the same time with the same architect. But what we, we're thrilled at, the original building that's set on that site is the one to the left, and that is the bank that was set there before, but they decided that bank wasn't big enough. So they, you know, somehow the city of King graciously allowed them to move it into the street and uh, set up business in the middle of the street while they were building the building. So it, we were always fascinated by that, that, you know, it obviously must have blocked off 80, 90% of the street if you had that building out there. So I, I don't know. Um, it's, it's a fascinating situation there. But 1917 was a real building boom here in King City. There was a lot of, uh, there was two big banks that were built. Uh, what was known at that particular time was First National, which became Bank of Italy, which became Bank of America. And then the Monterey County Bank, which eventually became Wells Fargo Bank. They were catacorny from each other uh, at Third Street. And other there was other big buildings that were built in King City. So it's a pretty interesting times uh, at that particular time in the century. So. That's uh, chapter five, turn of the century. Your turn okay, out. here's schools. <clears throat> this is a, a picture of the first public school. And I use that term because, so we don't get confusion. The actual first school in King City was a private school because there was no King City School District at the time. And it was on, in the second hundred block on the north side. It'd be a, by looking at the map, Looks like it would have been directly across from where uh, uh, Guadalajara is today. And we read that it was about a four month session and the teacher was Pearl Brown, who was uh, the sister to Charles King's wife. So it'd be a sister-in-law, although in most places we read, it says it was his niece, but actually we have to change that. It was not his niece. It was his sister-in-law that was the first teacher in King City. Then in uh, the summer of 1888, they constructed this building, the, the first public school in King City, uh, South Vanderhurst, where City Hall is today. And the school opened in September with Rosalie Brandstetter being the first school teacher. And then in 1890, Charles King and his wife, Kate, deeded, I believe, it was six lots to the King City School District. So they built this in 88 on that property but they didn't have title to it till 1890. Maybe that's the way they did it back then, I don't know. Or maybe the school district couldn't accept the property until 1890, I, I don't know the reason. And then after Rosalie, the next teacher was, was Olive Hamilton, uh, John Steinbeck's uh, mother. Thank you, Art. And of course, this picture uh, here is uh, says Kings City, California. And this particular photo is by Trout, which was a early photographer in the uh, valley here and uh, very sought after pictures, a lot of them. Okay, uh, talking about agriculture and irrigation. Of course, uh, as we spoke before, Charles King you know, came to this area, he planted wheat, had a very successful crop um, and what that helped precipitate having you know, King City um, get founded. Um, but one of the things that uh, after Claus Spreckles bought the uh, the ranch and started developing and eventually, you know, bringing in sugar beets, uh, irrigation was going to be, you know, a necessary because we had a limited amount of, of water. They uh, put in a canal uh, that where Canal Street in our town gets its name. There was a canal that started down about Wild Horse and came down and crossed the San Lorenzo River about the fairgrounds and basically came probably right through the middle of the hospital and uh, went underneath Broadway and eventually went out to the north side of town. There was another canal that started out um, on uh, Bitterwater Road and came in and eventually met that canal. But those were unsuccessful because we, you know, it's very much a, a seasonal river that we have, you know, the upside down river as some people call it. Um, so. Uh, 
uh, Spreckles, as well as a lot of other people, started uh, pumping water. Uh, originally, they had a steam plant that was kind of down behind the cemetery um, and eventually turned it to electrical. But this is concrete pipe that has been constructed. This particular site is on Ellis uh, at First Street. In the background, you can see uh, the El Rey Milling Company, uh, SP Milling Company, Meyer Tomato, uh, currently part of the H2A housing building that's behind it there with the little cupolas on top of it. Um, this was probably El Rey Milling at this time because there's a little kind of raised roof in the middle there, and that was because of El Rey Milling's equipment. But this is across the street. This is where they constructed the pipe. Eventually, a gentleman named Regus owned it uh, when my he was a contemporary of my father. So that was about the time, you know. The, yeah. So this we have where we think that possibly a lot of this pipe might have gone out to the California Orchard Company because they were developing the California Orchard Company. This picture here was taken about 1930, I believe. So one of the things that is notable about King City is that there's a highway that runs through it, not only a river that runs through it, but a highway. That Highway 101 has influenced the town greatly over the years. Um, in fact, there used to be, there would be so many cars that they had a sign in the middle of the street, you know, beware of pedestrians so that they could get the trucks and the cars to slow down. Um, the, because of this, people would come in on First Street and then make that 90 degree turn onto Broadway. And all along that route, there were gas stations and tire repair shops and restaurants and motels because we're halfway between Paso Robles and Salinas. And in the old days, people needed to stop uh, along the way to, um, to rest and to get nourishment. And so we had places like Kiefer's Restaurant. In fact, in our book, we have one of the Kiefer's pink bean soup recipes, which was a, a popular uh, thing. Kiefer's Restaurant was on the 300 block of Broadway until the highway moved in 1968 out to uh, closer to the river and bypass the downtown. Um, I like this picture. We put this in here because uh, they had to obviously stop traffic. This is the, the corner of 3rd and Broadway, and they brought in a, a group of young people to do a maypole dance, and obviously a big crowd showed up. Um, they must have had a detour for the traffic because otherwise that was the main street where, uh, where traffic uh, traveled. So, Has anybody ever done a maypole in here? <laughs> 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 uh, okay, so this is mine. And, um, you know, maybe Mesa Del Rey, you know, I mean, and it's kind of an odd picture maybe to, to talk about our airport, but uh, we put it in here. So um, um, some, some people don't realize, but during World War II, there was an airport here in King City that trained pilots. And um, eventually about 10,000 pilots started their careers here in King City. Um, they had about, a, it was about a, um, I think it was a 10 week program. And if they graduated from that, then they went on to two other 10 week programs. And then eventually they would go either to the Pacific or the European theater. Um, so a lot of, there's a, there's a set of annuals, uh, if you would call them that. Of course, they were only 10 weeks, so it wasn't, it wasn't a yearly annual, but uh, there are annuals that show all the pilots that graduated from here. Um, you know, Karen and I have collected probably about 20 of them. I do not know how many there are. Uh, it's a little hard to tell sometimes. But uh, uh, people would say, well, why would you put an airport in King City, you know, to train pilots? And um, in one of the uh, annuals, it talks about the flying days of King City. And there were 320 some flying days in King City. And that's because of our weather. We have a limited amount of rain. We have, you know, sure we have wind, you know, we have fog, but that may be in the morning or the afternoon. So they were getting 300 and some odd days of putting airplanes in the sky 
when they were training here. So it was obviously they were under a time crunch because of World War II. Uh, so that was very advantageous to be able to get an airplane basically in the sky almost every day. And so that was a big deal. But part of that, and the reason that we have this particular photograph in as kind of a uh, an indicator of Mission or Mesa del Rey, is that one of the other things that happened were is that there were people that were volunteers in King City that would did what they called plane spotting because we needed to know if there was enemy planes flying over. And so if you look carefully on top of the where it says hotel, you can see there's kind of an octagonal what appears to be like a little glass building up there. I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, I should put an arrow there, I guess. Um, and that is the spotting area. And um, we have interviewed uh, Joe Coaster and we were talking, let's Roberta see, Oswell. Roberta Oswell. And then uh, Tom Pettit, in the interview that we, we were just working on an interview for, of Tom Pettit, and he talks about his mother, I guess it was, and he was going up there with her uh, during that, as a little kid, that he would go up there with her, and she would do spot. And what they would do is they had a book, and it had the outline of the different pictures, and uh, they would write in that book what time it was, and when it, what direction it was flying, and what have you. Um, at McCarlam, there is a display about agricultural spraying, you know, in our fields. And one of the things that we discovered when we were doing that particular uh, display was that the agricultural airplanes had a great big A that was painted on the side of them. And so some of the photos we had had this great big A, and we all ask, well, why has he got that big A? Well, that was because they were flying during the war, and it needed to be say that they were from agriculture. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so Mesa del Rey, um, and obviously Mesa del Rey closed. We still have an airport, which is very, you know, for a small town, we have a great little airport here. It's got a like 4,800 foot runway, um, which is very, you know, a very nice. So it's a nice facility for a small town. Okay, this is a... <clears throat> under everyday life chapter. And this is the Salinas Valley Fair. Uh, and in this photograph, it has uh, four men that's helping the auctioneer to recognize the bidders. But we only recognize the two in the middle. That's Sam Adler Jr. on the left and uh, Francis Echenik on the right. I wish somebody could identify the, the two that's on, on either end. But the fair started in 1941 after a group of local uh, ranchers and uh, farmers got together and organized it. But then when World War II came, like most activities, why there was no fair. I think it was for three years and then it resumed. But really the first fairs in King City were in the 1920s. You read in the Rustler and they rented the Black Hall, Black Hawk uh, livery stable, which was on, on Broadway. And uh, that was the venue. And then that, it had krills in the back and that's where they kept the livestock. So the, the fair uh, has been in King City a long time, although between the 20s and 41, there was a big gap when there was no fair. But I'd like to go back just and add on to what John was talking about, the spotters for uh, the airplanes. Uh, I remember my dad did this in San Ardo and uh, we'd go, uh, the building was across the street from where the swimming pool is now. And I remember he had this book and he'd have to log what the, the plane looked like. Was it this model, this one, or this one? The direction and the time. But I found some of his notes when I interviewed him a few years back. And before that, it was done at the, uh, the OSP warehouse in San Arno. And he mentions that Bill Fluker, who was uh, the railroad agent at the time, he was also a volunteer spotter. And Bill would bring his uh, brown bag uh, lunch or dinner, what do you want to call it? And when he'd go on duty, why well, he'd open his bag up and sit down at the table or whatever they had, said, boy, this is just like camping out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say you had a bottle in there. <laughs> well, maybe so. I don't, I don't have that wrote down. <laughs> okay, so Lee's Valley Fair, everyday life. 
So uh, we'd like to thank uh, the Monterey County Free Library here in King City Branch uh, for helping us and for the support. And especially, you know, as Howard mentioned earlier, the microfilm scanner, which um, San Antonio Valley Historical Association helped to head up that uh, fundraising effort. You know, I think it was about $12,000. So it was a significant amount, but it's a computer-based microfilm scanner. And uh, it's really helped our research effort. And some people say, well, microfilm scanner, you know, that's like, what the heck are you buying a microfilm scanner? But um, actually, sure, digital material is very, you know, is, is very desirable. And being able to look up things in your home on your computer, you know, with optical character recognition is, is outstanding. But for long term uh, archival stuff, it is still put on a microfilm because it has a long shelf life. And, you know, you probably have computer programs, you know, you maybe still have some of those little floppy disks in your house. Can you read those? Probably not. And, but yet a microfilm that requires just light to look at it, you can still do it. So, um, you know, that's uh, something that uh, is, I think, very important. So, and uh, then this happens to be, this actually, this particular image right here, that we use on our, Karen and I have a card that we use. This is the very image that I got from Pat Hathaway when I went over to, to visit him to buy that. That was what kind of started a lot of the stuff right here. So this particular uh, picture, which is uh, downtown, uh, I think this is a Pickwick bus that is uh, in this picture because I have a Pickwick uh, bus schedule and it stops at the El Camino. And uh, that was a, a bus line that preceded the uh, uh, Greyhound. But this particular one, some people will say, well, what's that number where it says at 4109? And so it's hard to tell because every photographer may use his own uh, set of shorthand to describe what it is. I believe, or we believe, that that is the first one, the 41 is the date, 1941. 09 is the is the negative number. And so, uh, you know, he might take, you know, 41. And so this particular person, whoever it was, I do not know who took this there. I have probably about eight or 10 cards that have 41 and then sequential numbers. And there's some from Greenfield and some from Soledad. So he was obviously going up and down the valley. And what's interesting is there's some of the pinnacles and the numbers fit into the numbers in King City. So he must have come back to King City, took more pictures. So it's, you know, it's kind of fun to kind of chase that kind of stuff down. So anyway, we, and then do you want to talk about walking tours? Um, we do, John and I do walking tours of downtown and of the cemetery. So if any of you are interested in those, we just did a cemetery tour on All Souls Day and then another one on Veterans Day. It was wonderful to be in the cemetery with all the flags flying on Veterans Day. And we do those uh, as as people request them, and then we invite people to go along. It's it's usually about an hour and a half, and it's it's kind of a fun event. But we've learned a lot because of Howard's amazing knowledge of the the town. We've learned from that, and we've learned from reading old newspapers and and other books. So we just wanted to um, open it up for for questions if that's uh okay i'm gonna go ahead and stop the slide share so that we can you can see us and hear us and i see smiles and nods so that's good <laughs> and folks I'll, I'll do a quick thing to the folks in the audience everybody wave <laughs> <laughs> and um okay Thank you. And uh, yeah, we have time for questions, both from the audience here and also the audience on Zoom. And uh, uh, we have one already. And I think I want to read from Denise Campos. Uh, Will you continue to document King City history going forward? And will there be a second volume? <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Howard? Well, uh, me, I'm always documenting history, uh, not not particularly King City, because I, I could say specialized area of interest is all of Monterey County, but more from Township 18 South, which is roughly south of Soledad over to Big Sur and down to the county line. 
but I do also cheat and go over into San Benito County because San Benito used to be part of Monterey County. It wasn't created until 1874. And my family settled there in the 1870s. So they actually settled there when it was still part of Monterey County. So for me, the answer is yes. And John and I have been having this ongoing conversation about what will be our next project. And um, the, the Arcadia book is designed to go back about 50 years. So we started in 1886 with um, uh, the, the start of the town and our pictures go up through about 1970. There's a few that might be a little bit newer than that. So there is a, a window of, of the town's history that isn't in the book. And we've thought about doing something to, um, to record that. So it took a year, took a year and a half to publish this book by meeting every Tuesday with Howard for two or three hours and talking. Um, so we need to sit down um, after, probably after the first of the year and figure out what direction we're going to go. So if you have any advice for us as to what needs to be our next project, um, we're open to that. Well, just to, to tag on to that. Um, so when the process that we used doing the book was is that I would print a picture um, or what Karen or Howard would say, what about you know, this, and I would print the picture if I had it and, or find one. And then we would write an article about, it. well, we ended up after a year, we ended up with 250 articles and pictures. Well, our book, we were only allowed because Arcadia uses a formula. You know, um, this book is the same 128 page book that you would find in in any town USA across, you know, we Karen and I have bought probably 20 or 30 of these books from different places. So we had a limited amount, about 200 pictures. Well, that meant we had to call out 50 pictures just out of the material we already had. And of course, each one of us gave up pictures that we wanted. You know, there was a picture of a tow truck in front of the building across the street. And I desperately wanted that because my dad was in the towing business for a long time, but that didn't make the cut. And, you know, everybody else gave up pictures that they loved, but uh, to, to tell the story more completely in our book. And so, yeah, we've got lots of material. You know, we've got 50 pictures that we were going to put in the book, but we couldn't put in the books. And plus, you know, and every time we do something, you say, Mm, wow, I, I was looking at pictures last night and there was a picture of downtown King City. And I said, why didn't we use that picture in our book? <laughs> no, that's where it goes. The next book. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, I know you're talking about the limitation of the photos. Do you have any of the ones from the Adobe on Tolone Road? Are you referring to the Dutton? The old... Adobe, the old Adobe building. Yeah, the uh, if you're referring at Holon, the the Dutton Hotel. Um, uh, if you what? Made out of Adobe. Yes, yes. So if if I understand you correctly, there in Holon there was a stage stop that, and the name of it was the Dutton, um, and it's basically now it's just a pile of dirt and the only thing that really kind of exists of the town of Halone is St. Luke's Church and the Tidball and Mr. Tidball and Mr. Dutton were friends but then they had a political split and so one had the, the Tidball and one had the Dutton and uh, the Dutton was a very famous place. Uh, it was very, uh, apparently a great place to stay. And yes, we do have some pictures of that uh, taken in a snowstorm in 1911. Uh, we have some pictures, you know, some earlier pictures of that. I don't know, did we use one in our book? Yeah, we have one in our book, I think. Don't we? I think we might. So yes, so that might be something else. Do you have pictures of that? Um, no, I just remember when I was little going that way with my parents, and I also wanted to inquire about any pictures that you have from the Indian caves 
were there any that didn't get in the book? Mm -hmm. And because I do, I am aware you guys do have a cabin out there still. Is it still or not open to any of the members that? I don't know how they could do it nowadays. <laughs> Yeah, we um we had to decide how far we would go outside of King City. And so we have information about surrounding areas, uh -huh. but we really tried to stick with uh, King City. And so anybody is welcome to talk to us about other topics. If you want to see us afterwards, we can talk more about um, the Indians area because we do have a particular love for that. Yeah. But we wanna remind all of you that if you know of anybody who has old pictures, maybe in a box under a bed or in a basement that nobody's looked at for 30 or 40 years, keep us in mind because sometimes those pictures, you might not know where they are or who they are, but people like Howard might recognize the people or we might be able to see some buildings in the background that mean something to us. So, yeah. Right, so, yeah. I wonder if she is referring to the Adobe building that used to be the Salina Club. How do you? It was a club. Yeah. It was oh, yeah. Club. Oh, the Adobe. Oh, yeah. the, yeah. the, the Dun Adobe. Uh -huh. Yeah. The Adobe, 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 but yes, yeah, not yeah, yeah, yeah. That and and my era, my dad referred to that as the, the Dunn Adobe because Billy Dunn uh, married the owner, and uh, but it looks like to me it was part of the uh, one of the uh, Garcias homestead, and I think they said they moved there. I believe it was eighteen sixty eight and built a, a building so many feet and so many windows, so many doors. That's how they had to put it in the homestead records. And by the size of that building and, and the way it was built, it looks like to me that would have been uh, uh, Garcia's uh, original homestead building when he first moved up on, moved onto the property. And do you remember when they donated the remains of that adobe, they even found uh, adobe with yeah, that's right. They they donated some some of the uh, adobe uh, bricks blocks to an acetone, and they went and picked some up. And there was one. Uh, apparently, the adobe was still green, and it's all full of uh, uh, chicken footprints. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we know they had chickens there. <laughs> and I did uh, I did take pictures before it come tumbling down. Yeah. Uh, luckily one day I just maybe I should stop and take pictures of that so in a box somewhere <laughs> under the bed <laughs> under the bed or above the bed in the attic in the attic in the attic yeah I was just curious because I remember that as a child mm -hmm. well we hope that um the pictures in our book will remind people of a lot of things and bring up conversations and bring up memories that are are worth sharing so uh, we hope that if there's something in the book that you are interested in and or you want to give us feedback for we're we're open to that and sometimes that leads to interesting conversations and more information right. so back, back to the den adobe Obviously, it was in disrepair for for many years, because Leon Diggs uh, told me that when he was young, he worked for George Gamboa, who owned what we would call the Bengard property today, yeah. and he stayed in in the the, the Dun Adobe. And he said at night you could look up and see the stars. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs>